So we, we need to almost set up friction for the bad habits and reverse friction for the good habits, make them really easy to do, put the running clothes out the night before and don't be too ambitious about how long the run is going to be. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to the Unshakable Habits podcast. I am your host, Stephen Box. And today I have a topic for you that I know a lot of you guys can relate to. And it is you decide you're going to do something and there's only one way to do it, right? We have to go all in. It's go hard or go home. Well, maybe not. Maybe there is another way. Maybe there's a better way. Uh, and my guest today is going to actually come on and, and talk to us a little bit about that and, and how uh, taking a different approach worked for him in, in establishing some really great habits. And he also happens to have a really cool app um, called Focus Bear that we're going to talk a little bit about as well that kind of ties into this conversation. So with that, uh, allow me to introduce you to Mr. Jeremy Nagel, the founder of Focus Bear. Jeremy, welcome. Thanks a lot for having me on the show, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Jeremy, <sighs> I want to just kind of like throw this right into the deep end, right? Let's just kind of jump into the, the story because you were like a lot of guys. You, you kind of had that mentality of like, I have to go all in. If I'm not going to go all the way, what's even the point, right? And hmm. you, you kind of had this moment where you, you were reading the book, Tiny Habits, you, you told me, and you started reading about this idea of like small steps, um, so kind of take me back there. Like, what was life like prior to you reading that? Like, you know, I, I'm assuming you had some success and you probably had some failures. So I, I want to kind of hear about those and, and then talk to me about, you know, going forward. Like once you kind of got introduced to this concept, what happened? Sure. I'll start with one habit, which I think is emblematic of my approach to habits in general and that related to running. When I was in my early 20s, I used to be a mad keen runner. I'd be doing 100 mile weeks. I did some ultra marathons. I was really quite committed to it. And then as I got more into the workforce and things started getting busier, it dropped off a little bit. It got, as, as I guess progressed in my career, my running almost regressed and I, I stopped doing as much. But every time that I would start my running habit again, I'd be thinking about, uh, so the way that I approach this is I go to do 100 mile weeks. That was my mental model of what it meant to run because I, I, I was used to in the past knowing how far and how fast I could run and it was almost demoralizing for me to start with just doing a 5K run, for example. It felt too short. But I started to realize that I, if I wanted to get back to a consistent running habit, I had to let go of those old ideas and the old PBs that I had and make it more about just doing it every day and trying to enjoy the process rather than striving to break my old PBs again. I was going through a phase at the beginning of 2022 where life was very busy for me. I had two businesses that I was running. I was in the process of selling one of them, which was very stressful dealing with lawyers and accountants and tax people and protracted negotiations. And I had a, another job as well. So I, I was working very long hours. I was dealing with customers in the US and in Europe, which meant that my whole day was basically dealing with customer support and dealing with my team. And it just felt like there wasn't any time to look after myself even though I knew that if I started the day by going for a run in the morning, I actually could handle the stress much better. Yeah. What I ended up doing after reading the book, Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg was trying to approximate what he did. He started with doing two push ups every day. And it, it sounds ridiculous because it, it's such a small amount that it, it probably doesn't result in any, in any fitness gains. And I thought for me, the equivalent of that would be to go for a five minute run, which at that time, even though I wasn't running that much, I could probably go and run, say a, a 10 mile run without, it would be hard, but I could do it. So five minutes was just ludicrous, but I, I started doing it anyway, because I, I trusted the process around it. And I, I liked what he was saying that you start with something 
in a view of setting up your body and your mind to be able to do it every day. And I started doing it. And I, even though it was five minutes, I, I felt a little bit better after doing that. I got to the end of the run and felt like I wish I could have run further. It felt easy. And I, I did feel some degree of benefit from it. And then the next week, I upped it to six minutes. And I, I gradually, week by week, I increased it just as I did with my other habits as well. I started working in meditation, starting with five minutes of meditation, five minutes of journaling. So I had about a 15-minute core habit or core routine when I started. And I just built it up over time because it, it felt hard to carve out more than 15 minutes at the beginning. But as I worked on some of those habits, and a lot of them really help with clarity of mind and the ability for me to, to deal with stress, I was able to better cope with the work pressures that I had. And then it was okay to increase it from 15 minutes in total to 18 minutes the next week and progressively carving out more time for the morning routine until by the end of 2022, I'd sold my business. So some of the work pressure was off. And I was also consistently doing half an hour of running every day and doing a, a heap of journaling and meditation, sleeping much better and generally a lot happier with life. In February 2022, if I had tried to begin with, say, half an hour of running and half an hour of journaling and the, the other habits that I have now, it just wouldn't have stuck at all. I would have ended up not doing anything. I'd wake up in the morning and think, I've got too much work to do. There's no way that I can do half an hour, so I won't bother at all. Whereas having a small amount that I knew that I could do, that meant that I could build it up over time. Yeah, I, I love what, what you're talking about here because this is very much in line with something I talk a lot about, which is you have to understand that everything in your life is a stressor, right? Some of those stressors are good stressors and, and, and some of them are bad, right? But the thing is, you may be able to handle small things like when it's just that thing. But what happens for a lot of us is we have so many small things, right? It's, it's work. It's, you know, our marriage. It's if you're, if you have kids, you know, doing things with your kids, it's finding time for friends and, you know, family outside of your, your house It's finding time for exercise. It's finding time to, you know, sit and, and have some quiet time to yourself. It's finding time to, fix food or, or make healthy, you know, choices with your nutrition, right? And all these little decisions, all these little things, they start to add up. And when we put too many things on our plate at once, even though we can handle any of those things easily on their own, they become overwhelming. And, and that's what you just described was, yes, you could go out and run a 10 mile run not necessarily easily, because you said you might be a little bit hard, but you could have done it fairly easily, right? And by itself, that wouldn't have been a big stressor. But when you add in running two businesses and working and trying to sell one and, you know, still trying to make time for your marriage and all this other stuff, that was just impossible. Yeah, absolutely. And there was, I guess, a compounding effect as well that I found that if I started the day by checking emails, which is what my brain really directed me towards, that I'd, I'd wake up and I had past experience of where there'd been really bad issues that had happened overnight and there's basically fires to put out first thing in my, my mind because of those, those bad experiences in recent history, I felt that I had to immediately go to that. But I found that if I did if I did satisfy that urge and I did go and check my emails, I'd look up and it was three hours later and then there wasn't really time to go for a run or do any of those other things. So for me, it was a combination of noticing that there were those stresses in my life, but, but also being able to, to build up the courage to, to just carve out a little bit of time for myself and knowing that I could handle the stresses better. And I had yeah. to actually, the app that I built was designed for that to block me from checking email until I had done my meditation and my run. Cause yeah. I knew that 
I guess it's a bit like a technology addiction in some ways that Mm -hmm. I had set up a bad habit for myself of waking up and checking my email and maybe for other people it's waking up and checking Instagram or going on TikTok, something like that. But Mm -hmm. it's really about in order to do the good habits, I think it may involve stopping doing some of the bad habits as well. Yeah. So something that you, you brought up there, right, is we have these triggers like we all have them, right? So whether that's the sound of your email notification going off and you have to look at it or whether that's just your routine is to go pick up your phone and start checking emails as soon as you get up or, or whatever, right? We all kind of have these routines and we have these triggers that that kick them off. And I think something that people maybe will miss here, and I, I just want to kind of point this out because I think you, you basically said that you experienced this, but tell me if you if I'm wrong here is you started making assumptions, even if it was on a subconscious level, that when you open that email, there were going to be problems to deal with. So before you even got to the email, you already were like ruining your day, right? Because you're already getting into a negative mindset about when I open this email, there's going to be problems to deal with. Yeah, uh, though there may also be an aspect of almost the conditional reward aspect where sometimes there would be a good email that didn't happen as often but it's that gambling mentality that every so often i'd look in my email and i've just won this big deal and or maybe there's some progress with the sale of the business and so i'd i'd be either (laughs) i'm training myself that when i open the, the email it's a slot machine that there could be something fun in there Whereas I know that if I go for a run, there's probably not anything amazing that's going to happen. It's going to be pretty good for my dopamine levels, but not as good as if I get something unexpected from emails. And that's the the hard part that the same with social media, that there could be something unexpected there. Maybe I've done a post on LinkedIn and maybe a hundred people are going to like it. And it's that, that, that's why I think social media can be so addictive and so hard to let go of. And why it's so important to set boundaries in place as well. Yeah, it's it's that constant dopamine hit, right? It's that, you know, the the FOMO, the fear of losing out or missing out, where, you know, you're like, oh, what if what if I miss something? What if what if a client emailed me and I lose out an opportunity because somebody else beat me back to the callback? And I think a lot of guys can relate to that where we want to make things a priority, but sometimes it's really hard to deprioritize other things, especially business, I think for a lot of guys, uh, because for a lot of us, our identity is wrapped up in our titles and and our income and our role as providers in our families. And so you start talking about like, hey, don't check your email until, you know, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning after you've had a chance to go do your workout and eat some breakfast and all that kind of stuff, people are like, whoa, you're talking crazy. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't go that long without like my email. Hmm. Yeah, for me, it was even just to don't check it until 6.30 a.m. because I'd be waking yeah. up at 5.30 a.m. and uh, in the past going straight to email even then because in Australia, the overlap with the US time zone is very challenging. I basically have to start work very early to have any overlap. But yeah, I think creating some space between when we wake up and when we get into those dopamine inducing websites or apps, that's so important. It's really been critical for me in order to develop these self-care habits. Yeah. And that's fair enough on the time. I'm a night owl. So I usually am up to like one, two o'clock in the morning. So I don't actually wake up until like 8 30 9 o'clock so for me when i say 10 11 o'clock that's you know that's <laughs> the equivalent of most of y'all out there who are morning people probably you know uh might be like six seven o'clock for you guys so you know if, if you're a morning person you're probably more on jeremy's schedule if you're a night owl you're probably on more on my schedule so we've got something for everybody here <laughs> <laughs> yep so so let's talk a little bit about this app because I like the idea here that we're going to use an external thing, right? I I talk about, you know, internal motivation a lot. And I believe that ultimately we all need to work towards internal motivation, right? Because internal motivation is what really allows us to stay consistent. But early on in the process, 
internal motivation is hard to come by. And you haven't developed your routine. You haven't developed the consistency yet. And it's really difficult because that identity is not there. And I think that's where external tools like your app can really come in handy. So talk to me a little bit about like what the app does and, and what is some of the science behind it? Sure. In some ways, I feel that for me, the purpose of the app is essentially to bottle the motivation that I that I have the day before, because maybe it's 11 a.m. and I've spent three hours on emails and I haven't done anything, I haven't gone for a run or meditated and I feel bad about it. And so I set an intention at that point, tomorrow I really do want to wake up and I don't want to check my emails and instead I want to meditate and I want to journal and I want to go for a run. And essentially what the app allows me to do is I go in and I plug in what I want to do for my morning routine at a time when my motivation is high. And then in the morning when I wake up and maybe I'm not that with it first thing in the morning and I might be tempted to instead do something that's a little bit easier rather than doing the hard things that are actually good for me, I've got the app there to back me up because it's essentially got my yesterday self when I was in a state of high motivation, I've got that scaffold there to keep me on track. And it's not like it. It's some um, taskmaster that I don't care about. It's actually me. I'm the one who put it in there. I'm the one who decided that I want to meditate and I want to run. So I feel feel very congruent when I do wake up and I essentially see the app on all my devices. The way that it works is on iPhone, on Mac, on Windows, on Android. When I open it first thing in the morning, what I see are my morning routine habits. And if I try and open TikTok or I go to my email, it essentially blocks me and says, hey, remember you wanted to do running first thing. And I, I have to, for me personally, I've got a password in place. So if I want to override it, I have to get my wife to, to go and put in the password. <laughs> And she, yes. I have to have a good reason because she knows yeah. I, I've said it to her as well that I do, I do much better if I wake up and I meditate. Yeah. So there, there will be times where there's an emergency and I have to change things around. But the vast majority of the time these days, I, I stick to my morning routine. Yeah. And it's partly because I've been using the app, but it's also because I've done it for a while now. And there's that idea that maybe it takes 21 days or 200 days. I don't know that there's a, there's a firm rule, but there is some period after which the habit becomes very instinctive. And it's, yeah. I don't really need the app necessarily now. I'm, I'm very trained. I've, I've got it set up both in terms of what I'm motivated to do, but also just what I'm habituated to do, that I wake up and I go for a run. Yeah. And that the app helps to scaffold that internal drive. Yeah, you know, my take on this is a little bit different in terms of the the whole like how long it takes thing, uh, because I know there's like several different numbers out there and people love to talk about the numbers and I and I get that because it's it's nicer and cleaner when we can give definitive answers to people. But I have honestly found that there is no magic number. Right. I've seen yeah, people say something for 365 days and still end up falling off the moment they they miss a day or two. So clearly there is no number of days that like entrench a habit, right? For, for me, what I found is it is the moment the person starts to identify with that and they've also put in place the resources and the tools they need for when things get off track. Right. It's those combination of those two things that make that happen. Some people, that might be two days. Other people, it might be two years. Right. It's just, it's all about you and, and where you are and how long it takes you to, uh, to develop that identity and to get those systems in place. And when I say systems, like I mean something very simple, like if you plan to go for a run at 6 a.m., and something pressing actually comes up and you need to take care of it first, your system is, if I don't get to run at six, I'm going to go run at lunchtime at 12, right? So you have flexibility in your system that allows that, but there is a backup plan. It's not just, oh, well, I guess I'm not gonna do my run today because something else came up. 
Mm. Yeah, that's really key. And if it is flexible and if the environment is set up in a way that there's lots of triggers reminding me that I do want to run and like you said, part of my identity, then it's going to happen. And going back to your question about what's the science behind it, BJ Fogg in his book, he's done a fair bit of research around what causes people to be able to stick to habits. And a big part of it is motivation. So that speaks to a becoming part of my identity that rather than me just thinking sometimes I run occasionally, it's I am a runner and that yeah. and it makes me feel good and I wouldn't feel congruent if I didn't go for a run. And then the second part, he talks about triggers that we need reminders in the environment and after some time, it's just when I wake up, that's the trigger that I know the first thing that I do after I wake up is go for a run. But in initially, when those triggers, those internal triggers haven't been established, maybe we need more things in the external environment, which could be a running buddy, or it could be post-it notes on the wall, or it could be an app to remind us. Yeah. And then the third thing that he talks about is that it needs to be easy, that if it if it's going to really stretch us, then it's harder for it to be a habit because we're contending with the other aspects in our environment, like checking TikTok, which is very easy to do and has a high degree of motivation because there might be something cool that we see there. Yeah. So we, we need to almost set up friction for the bad habits and reverse friction for the good habits, make them really easy to do, put the running clothes out the night before and don't be too ambitious about how long the run is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and guys, um, I'm going to point this out to y'all real quick because Jeremy hit on something that I think is absolutely brilliant. If you have something that you want to prevent yourself from doing, make your wife the gatekeeper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I, they will not break unless you give them a really good reason to like, if you tell your wife, like, listen, I'm doing this for my health or whatever. If, if you were to go buy a safe and you gave your wife the key and you like put on all your like snacks and candy and things like that, that you wanted to be able to have inside the safe. And the only way for you to get in there was for your wife to take the key and go open it for you you're not going to be eating a lot of sweets. Okay. It's just, it's not going to happen. So, so I love the fact that she said like, mm. you have a password on the app that your wife has to put in a password for you because you can't put it in. You can't get around it because you'll easily justify to yourself why you just need to check that email real quick. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it, it, it is a fine line. Cause I think I, I don't want to be harassing my wife and constantly bugging her. But it, yeah. I think that's part of it as well, that that helps with the motivation that when I think about engaging in a, in a habit, if I think about checking my email, then the next thought is, oh, but I'll have to go ask my wife to unlock it for me. Is it really worth it? Whereas if I, I don't have that friction in place, then maybe the, the thinking process is less, that it's more the lizard part of my brain that will intervene. Yeah, that's what I like, you know, is is this idea that you're creating friction uh, with this, with the app here, right? Where it's like somebody goes to do something, they go to check email, Facebook, whatever, and it's going to pop up. And it just, even if it's just a second, even if you're not using the password and you're making it to where you can just easily click the the button to like allow you to go look at it or whatever, a lot of times just that pause, even just that moment to bring awareness and be able to ask yourself, like, do I really need to do this right now? Is this really how I should be spending my time is enough to get you to go, okay, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, for sure. That's really the, the key for me to have that gap between the stimulus and the response and having little speed bumps in place for the times where I'm about to go downhill very fast. <laughs> Now, one thing that, that's very interesting to me about your app is it was developed really for people with ADHD specifically, like so people who really have trouble focusing and, and get easily distracted by different things. So what made you focus really specifically on that group? Initially, I built the app for myself and I, I started sharing it with other people 
And I noticed something quite quickly, which was that the people who seemed interested in it were people who self-identified with ADHD. And I, at the time, I didn't have a diagnosis and I just thought, hey, this is curious. Yeah. And as I started to hear from more people, I started to think, maybe I should get check this checked out myself. So I ended up going and talking to a psychologist in the middle of 2022. And I was, I think, 98% of the qualifying characteristics for ADHD. I had never really considered that before, but some of the questions like, do you feel like you're driven as if by a motor and are you unable to sit still? And do you sometimes interrupt people? Do you, are you, you constantly thinking about new ideas? I, I definitely identified with all of them. I think for me, the reason why it perhaps hadn't shown up earlier is because I also got diagnosed with autism. That was something that I had no doubt about. And I was aware of probably from my teenage years, I didn't get a formal diagnosis until 2015. I'd got a, a pre-diagnosis at that part at that point, And it was confirmed in 2022. And I think the combination is a little bit different from when someone only has ADHD and you get the kids who are constantly getting up and misbehaving in class. Whereas the combination for me of ADHD and autism meant that I was generally a pretty well-behaved child, just a very reserved one. But in my head, I was constantly buzzing with new ideas. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess during school, there's opportunities for, for going out and a lot of the, the recesses I do running based activities. And I think that really helped me to be able to stay on track, being able to release some of the, the physical tension that maybe I felt and the, the anxiety. But it's interesting then in the workplace, I found it very hard to work a conventional job. I really hated working in an office. I could do it, but it felt very challenging for me. And I, I really enjoyed, not everyone liked the pandemic, but for me, I, I liked being able to work from home because it meant that I, I could go for a run in the morning without worrying about the commute and actually also do micro workouts throughout the day, which is something that a lot of people with ADHD find helpful, which is where I have a, as part of the Focus Bear app, every 25 minutes, it will remind me to take a short break. And I'll do things like do a set of push ups or grab my dumbbells and, and do a, a little, a, a light little workout yeah. there. And it, it gets the blood flowing. And I find that I feel energized, my mood is better, and my ability to focus is better. It's been yeah. really enlightening just hearing about different techniques that people with ADHD use and finding that many of them help me. And I work with an ADHD coach now as well. And that's really awesome. been assisting me to deal with some of the, the challenges with executive function. Yeah. And, and guys, I'll tell you, if you, if you don't have AD, ADHD or autism, that doesn't mean that you can't benefit from this. It doesn't mean that you can't use it uh, because I think a lot of the, the symptoms of ADHD are things that in our society today, because we're all so busy, we have so many things on our to-do list that we all experience those symptoms, right? Whether we have ADHD or not. Um, so I think anybody can definitely benefit from this, but I, I love the fact that, you know, you're calling out like for this specific group, because I do feel like a lot of times when people get these diagnoses, it's almost like they're being told that something's wrong with them, right? It's like, oh, you, you know, you have this. And the first thing they want to do is put you on medications. And outside of putting you on medication, there's not really a lot of things that are specifically out there to say, here's something that can help you, right? It's usually tools available, but you kind of have to go join groups and talk to people and figure out what they're offering. So, so I love the fact that you're actually really putting this out there for that group to say like, hey, if someone's told you that you have this, here's a great tool for you. Yeah. And it's not enough on its own. I, I think for me, working with a coach is really important and doing some of the, the other practices, optimizing sleep, exercise, doing meditation, and potentially for, for some people taking medication as well. It, it's part of a holistic solution. An app isn't enough on its own, but if we yeah. combine it with everything together, then that's where there's going to be the potential for, for real growth and harnessing some of the benefits of the condition as well that 
I think a lot of my entrepreneurial drive has come from the creative juices I get from my ADHD brain. So there's definitely pros and cons to it. And there is a a spectrum as well. It's a bit like with autism that it's recognized that there's a a spectrum. I'm level one, which is the, the lowest level. And then there's level three where it's really severe. And I think even though ADHD isn't identified as a spectrum, I think it essentially is that everyone, especially with the the pull of technology now, probably sits somewhere on, they also talk about variable attention stimulus trait, which is a, a non-pathological definition that, that many of us now find that there's so many distractions out there and our brain can find it hard to actually settle on one task for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you brought it up and I think it ties in with I, what I always talk about, this idea of connected health, right? Where it's the physical, it's the mental, the emotional, the relationships, the environment, uh, your your spiritual or existential health. And it's kind of that same concept, right? It's, yes, that the app is helpful. And for some people, I you know, and I hope that, that it didn't come across this way to anybody, but I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with medication, but I do feel like sometimes our healthcare industry, especially here in the U S is too quick to just throw people on medications without really trying to help them any other way. Um, but absolutely no, you know, no qualms about people who actually do need the medications seeing that they, you know, having them on it. Um, but at the same time, you know, I like that you point out, it's not, it doesn't matter if you use the app. It doesn't matter if you are medications, if you're not taking the steps to do the other things, right? If you're not putting in the time for exercise and getting your body healthy, if you're not taking some quiet time and meditation to help get your, your mind and, and your, your emotions in check, right? If you're not putting things in your environment to help you be successful, that, then, you know, you're going to continue to struggle. So it's, it is that holistic approach to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think that's often the way that medication is used, that it's a stepping stone to being able to develop the metacognitive strategies that will will make it possible to actually cope with life without necessarily needing to to always be on on medication. And I, I don't take medication myself at this stage, like you said, not opposed to it, but I think it it's it's not enough on its own. Nothing is a silver bullet. We really need connected health. I love the way you put it. Yeah. Uh, so so one of the other things that you talk about on here is uh, about decision fatigue. And now I've seen other apps out there that will block you know you from opening websites and, and things like that. I mean that that's not really new per se. Uh, but a couple things that you have on here that are that I think are unique that I haven't seen in any other apps. And, and one is this fact of eliminating decision fatigue by saving those routines and then be able to set them to automatically come up so that there is no having to think about it in the morning, no having to like go in and, and add stuff every day of oh, what do I want to add to my list today? It's it's already there. It's it's there for you to, to just check in and just do. Yeah, the inspiration for that was I've, I've found in the past that when I do workouts, if I have to come up with it on my own, for example, if you ask me to do 20 minutes of yoga, I'm not going to remember the sequence of asanas that I do or if I'm doing a, a weightlifting workout, I'm not going to remember the different lifts that I want to do. But if I follow along to a YouTube video where there's a great many of them now where they'll have a countdown timer and you watch what the person is doing and basically copy them, I found that so easy and so fun. I basically wanted a way to do that for my whole routine. And I was initially thinking about that I would record myself for an hour and a half as I did my morning routine and each day I would just copy myself doing the video. But I realized that that was a little bit challenging. And instead, I'd have a similar experience by I'd have countdown timers and I'd have in certain cases for meditation and for doing HIIT or for doing weightlifting, I would use YouTube videos or I I sometimes also use Beachbody On Demand, which is a a, a exercise website. Mm -hmm. And I can just copy what other people are doing and it works well in the morning, especially when I don't have a lot of brain power or a lot of motivation and I can just copy them. And I, I don't have to think about what am I going to do next? 
it's yeah. there i've i've got the the routine set up already and i just go along and follow it and some people yeah. might think that's almost maybe that's not a good thing that i'm becoming almost like a robot and i'm just doing what i'm programming myself to do but i really love what jocko willick says he talks about discipline being freedom that when i do those practices first thing in the morning it frees up space for me to be creative Whereas yeah. if I just do whatever I feel like first thing in the morning, I'm likely to end up regretting my day and feel that I didn't actually achieve the things that I set out to do. Yeah. No, I, you know, honestly, I think having the routine there is, is really good, right? Like not having to think about it, uh, just having something to follow. I actually have multiple certifications as a, tr a personal trainer. Uh, I actually am considered by uh, the ISSA, which is the International Sports and Sciences Association. Uh, I am actually a elite level trainer is, is what my technical certification is at this point, because I have so many different certifications. And I still like will take programs that other people write and just put them into my workout log and do them. <laughs> like I, I can write my own, but it's just, you know, Sometimes it's just easier for me to go, you know what, that looks like a good workout. I'm just going to steal theirs. Like I'm just going to do their stuff. Right. And so I, I think it's actually a brilliant idea. What, one of the apps that I use to deliver my workouts to my clients, it doesn't even have a calendar. It literally is the next workout on the list. So like whatever is next, whatever day today is, you just do that workout. That's it. Hmm, I like that. So you, you don't get overwhelmed by looking at all the workouts in the future. It's just the next one. Yeah, you just you just do the one that's in front of you. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. You just do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like what you're saying as well about trying out programs from other people. I think for me, one aspect that I enjoy is the novelty that each morning I get a random yoga video and a, a random meditation video because I've got 15 different videos and I don't know what's going to be coming up each morning. The app's yeah. going to choose one for me out of the list that I pre-selected. And that's quite yeah. fun. It, it's almost similar to the dopamine hit that I get from checking email and maybe there's something exciting in there. It's similar with yeah. what workout am I going to get today? What am I going to get today? Now, I will just point this out for, for anybody who's listening. There are levels of exercise. So my definitions here, okay, first is movement. Movement is just like your everyday routine. So that's little stuff like Jeremy was talking about earlier about get up every 25 minutes and move around, right? That's, that's just movement. It's walking around your normal daily routine. Uh, maybe, you know, it's a little bit intentional. But for the most part, it's just kind of what happens. Then there is exercise. Now, exercise is usually a little bit more exertion required. It's a little bit more intentional, but it's not structured. So this is like, you know what? I think I'm just going to go for a walk today or, or whatever, right? Or I'm just going to pull up a, a yoga video off YouTube and I'm going to do that. And you are exercising. Now, then there's training or well actually there, there's working out and working out is more structured right so this is like when you're not just randomly picking things like what we're talking about here this is where you want to start having a little bit more structure but the structure is kind of like a week-to-week -week thing in my mind right it's not a long-term plan on it you're just you're maybe kind of thinking about like okay this week i'm gonna train you know uh full body three times or whatever and you're being very intentional about what you're training and then there's actual training. And, and this is like when you start getting into all the really technical stuff and you've got like 12 week plans laid out and it's all very specific and everything's in order for a reason and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so there are different levels to this. So just for anybody out there listening to this, I don't want you to, to think that this is like the only way to, to work out. There are actually a lot of different ways to kind of do this and a lot of levels to it. But if you're just getting started, kind of like Jeremy's example earlier about going for the five minute run, if you're just getting back into it, don't feel like you need a, a 12 week training program designed to help you lose 20 pounds or pack on 10 pounds of muscle or whatever, right? It's 
and, and by the way, you're not going to pack on 10 pounds of muscle that fast. Sorry to tell you guys. Um, but, it, you know, instead of feeling like you have to go do all this crazy stuff, it's okay if you're just starting at that level where it's just, you're just moving a little extra. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also, I guess, there's the mindset of, of challenges, which is almost similar to crash dieting sometimes that if I, if I tell myself, I'm just going to stick it out for 12 weeks and then I, I'm going to be invincible by the end and I, I will have packed on this much muscle, but maybe it's not enjoyable and it's not something that's going to be long-term and sustainable. And for me, it, it's really been about getting back into enjoying exercise so that it's not merely a, a means to a goal, but it's actually something that I'll do for the rest of my life. And I have, as part of that, I now am following a 12-week program for yeah. weightlifting and that that is helpful and I enjoy it. But I think if I had begun with that, I don't think I would have necessarily liked yeah. it. And the same with running that I'm training for a half marathon at the moment and I do have a structured plan for the yeah. long runs that I'm going to do and the workouts that I do. But I also, a couple of runs per week are just about me enjoying moving my legs and enjoying running next to the beach and waking up yeah. in the morning. So it's that combination of making sure that it's fun as well as something that's going to potentially have benefits. Yeah. And, and, you know, to me, it's, it just kind of points out this idea that so many people out there want to tell you like their way is the absolute best way. And I always say, if you find somebody who tells you that they found the absolute single best way for every single person to do something, run away as fast as you can because they are full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> yep. There is no such thing. We're all, we're, we're individuals. So you have to figure out what works for you. And sometimes that means starting a little bit on the slower side and, and kind of finding your groove and figuring out like what, what actually fits best for you. So I love, I love that example. Yeah. And trusting that over time that it's going to potentially in a year, there's going to be transformation there. But if I, if I think back to where I was at fitness wise at the beginning of 2022, I, I could just barely run 10 miles, but it would have been quite slow. And now I'm, I'm actually in the best shape that I've been in my whole life. I, I broke my, the PB that I set for 5k when I was 18, I broke that last year and I'm a lot stronger than I was back then, but it, it's been something that it ha has been more of a, an after effect that it's just been about developing the consistency. And then the fitness comes as well from the consistency. Whereas if I, I just tried to go really hard in the beginning, I probably would have injured myself and I wouldn't have enjoyed the process. Yeah. I, it's funny you bring that up because I actually am right now I'm working on recording a solo episode of the podcast um, that may end up actually in, in the weird world of podcasting may actually end up getting published before this one actually comes out. So people are like, wait, did I already hear that? Uh, <laughs> but it's about that concept of when you go to say like do something like lose weight, what you're focusing on is not a goal but an outcome right it's a result and, and the thing is we rarely have full control over the actual outcome we we can we have some control over it but it's minimal what we have full control over is our behaviors right so if you set out to say i'm going to lose 30 pounds then you're more likely to struggle with that if the weight's not coming off quick enough you lose motivation or you start doing things that are less healthy for you overall just to get to that number on the scale or maybe you get there and then you stop all the things that helped you get there and now you put the weight back on right versus if you focus on the behaviors of what what are the behaviors of someone who weighs 30 pounds less than me right? And you start doing those on a daily basis and you start to develop an identity around them. The 30 pounds happens almost magically without you even thinking about it. Mm. And it's an enjoyable process as well that starting yeah. to inhabit that identity and doesn't feel as hard. Yeah. So, so that, that sound, you know, to me, like when you were just talking about that, it's like, I was like, man, it's like he was in my head as I was thinking about this earlier. <laughs> All right. So one, one question I wanted to ask you here, uh, something else you have on the map 
on the app, excuse me, that is different than anything I've seen. Uh, so you're going to have to explain this one to me because I'm not quite picking it up off of what I'm seeing on the website here is your app uses visual cues to increase focus. So talk to me about that. There was a research study done in 2020 where they looked at how to help people to focus and they they had two conditions. One was where people did nothing before they started this complicated task and the other option was where they looked at a target on the wall. So it was literally like a gun sight target and they looked at that intensely for 30 seconds. And the research study found that Focusing the visual system in that way resulted in sharper focus for the next exercise. There seems to be some kind of connection between focusing our vision and literally being able to focus our brains as well. And that's something that maybe we don't have that often when we're working on computers where we're often flitting from tab to tab and our vision may not be focused in one area. So what we have yeah. in the app is before the morning routine begins and you can also initiate it at other times. It brings up this crosshair and you look at it for 30 seconds and I find that it does help with focus. I, I think there are other ways though that we can get into that focus state. I, I find that doing the little micro workouts is really helpful for me that when I, if, if I've been sitting down for two hours, then my ability to concentrate is massively diminished. But if I get up yeah. periodically and I'm drinking water and I'm doing deep breathing and I'm perhaps doing push ups from time to time, I actually, I find that my ability to focus is a lot better. I, yeah. I'm actually thinking about removing that from the app because I, I sometimes find I, I do it when I really need focus, but I don't necessarily enjoy doing it every day because it, it is a little bit challenging to be staring at the crosshair very intently. But it's something that that's you don't necessarily need the app. You can also, if you, you are now listening to this and you had something on the wall, just looking at that very intensely for 30 seconds before you begin a task, that may actually help you to be able to concentrate. Okay, so this is kind of similar to uh, visualization, right? Where like you picture yourself succeeding in doing something, um, but instead of it just being a mental picture that you're drawing, you're actually getting your actual eyes to kind of focus on something. But I imagine it's probably activating some of the same centers in the brain because uh, they sound very similar to me. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned visualization because that's actually what I want to replace the that tool with because I think or in addition to that, it's so helpful to at the beginning of the day or the beginning of the focus session to be reflecting on where am I going, who do I want to become, what is the, the vision for my life that I'm trying to create because that really helps to boost motivation if I can think about this is why I'm doing it and I've either got a mental picture or I've potentially got a vision board where I can maybe that's on the wall and that's what I'm looking at in those 30 seconds as well yeah yeah I think you know it's it's good sometimes to step back and look at that bigger picture right where if we say okay if I do this today that's you know where my focus is right now but I do like to ask myself the question sometimes of if I do this for 30 days in a row, 100 days in a row, 1,000 days in a row, right, what is going to be the cumulative effect of that? What is going to happen when this becomes something I'm consistently doing, right? And I think when you start thinking about it that way, you start to see the bigger picture of things, but you don't lose track of the idea that it is a single day at a time, or, or as I always like to say it, creating a habit is not making a decision one time and then applying willpower to it. It is making the same decision over and over and over again every single day. Hmm. I like that. So anything else that you would like to, to share about that, that app itself or, or just about your journey or anything 
that you really want people just to kind of be able to walk away with today? The biggest message is that tiny habits approach. The book is excellent. I would suggest that people read it. There's also Atomic Habits, which in many ways is based on Tiny Habits. And Tiny Habits is a, a short book and it, it has powerful science in there and, and really clear examples of how to implement habits in your life and of yeah. starting from something small. And like you said, thinking about what is the result going to be if I do this small habit and maybe build it up over time for 30 days, 60 days, a year, what are the benefits going to be? And they, they are huge that I've definitely experienced that myself, that compared to where I was when I started with the, the tiny habits, my fitness, my health, my mental clarity is so much better. But I couldn't have yeah. got there from starting with large habits. I had to start small. Love it. Love it. Um, so, Jeremy, if someone wants to uh, be able to connect with you personally, what's the best way for them to do that? I can share my LinkedIn and maybe we can put that in, in the show notes and also yeah, we'll, I we'll, check we'll, yeah, we'll in the show notes. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And the other option is if you go to focusbear.io, there's a, a chat option there and I'll see all those messages as well. Okay, cool. Um, and they can also get the app there on, on the website as well, I assume. Yeah. And we'll have a, a discount code that will be in the show notes. We'll give Listeners of the podcast, 50% off. All right. So, so now you guys have to go to the show notes and check that out because there's going to be a discount <laughs> code there for, so you can get 50% off on the app. So, um, Jeremy, I really appreciate you uh, you coming on today, uh, being willing to, to kind of share your story and, and talk a little bit about not just like the app itself, but really kind of the motivation behind what are these different features for? Because I think a lot of times – we get so caught up in technology and all the features of it that we don't necessarily stop to pull back and go, why is that even there? Right. Why is that important? Uh, so I, I hope that, you know, people really got a lot of value today out of hearing, not just what these features are, but like why they exist and, and kind of you be able to link it back to your personal story, your personal life. And, you know, people will really be able to see that these are things that you didn't just put in there just for the sake of adding them. You put them in there because they were things that benefited you at some point and, and you feel like they're going to benefit other people. And quite frankly, I agree with you. <laughs> awesome. Yep. That's definitely been the approach. Awesome. Well, again, appreciate your, your time today. And uh, guys, I just want to remind you that while none of us are born unshakable, we all can become unshakable thank you for listening to the unshakable habits podcast with coach steven box be sure to hit the subscribe button and help us spread the word by sharing the podcast with other men if you're ready to create unshakable habits you can learn more and connect with us at unshakablehabits.com